Welcome back to another video. Today, we're gonna to be hopping in the boat with Donnie Albert. We're gonna be on the Rainy River, and he's gonna share a bunch of tips that'll help you catch more walleyes on that particular river this spring. So without further ado, let's jump right in. The Rainy River is a, it's a river about 90 miles long, runs from Rainy Lake um, to Lake of the Woods. Flow is east to west. Uh, and in the spring, there are uh, a healthy number of, of large female walleyes that will come up the Rainy River to spawn. And there's an open season, <clears throat> catch and release only, till April 14th. And uh, so we get an influx of anglers who are, you know, a lot of guys are real diehard walleye guys, and this is kind of their first chance to get out on open water. You know, there's always pool two and pool four. Um, down in the Mississippi too, but this is this is for a lot of guys. This is their you know it's their first shot to get the boat out, and I think I really think in in the state of Minnesota this is your best shot at a thirty. <laughs> this ain't a thirty, but I think it's it's probably this a little rat, but it's probably your best shot at a thirty inch walleye in the state of Minnesota, at least real consistent. Uh, that was about what I thought it was. Um, so we get an influx of people uh, coming up here looking to catch the biggest walleye of their life. And, and every year that does happen for quite a few people. So, um, you know, it's uh, it can be a, a bit of a volatile time on the river. Uh, we never know exactly how many days we're going to get. I've had days where, uh, or years where, we only had four or five days of open water to fish. I mean, kind of all depends on when the river thaws out and when the first accesses are open for big boats. Um, you know, so I, I've had where we've had up to three weeks and I've had up where we've had only four days, four or five days. So um, it can be tough to plan around, but uh, definitely a good shot at a big walleye. The biggest walleye probably of your life will be up here on the Rainy River. Next up, Donnie's got a few more tips that'll help you catch walleyes if you're heading to the Rainy River anytime soon. Uh, one of the first things that you, you probably ought to know is that, that the river is um, border. It's border water. So uh, the border does not necessarily run down the middle of the river. So um, there are different rules on each side of the river. Uh, on the Canadian side, there's no alcohol and there's no, no um, live bait or, or preserve bait. No biological whatsoever can be crossed um, in international borders. So um, if you're gonna fish on the Canadian side, it's, it's jigs and plastics, um, you know, some sort of paddle tail uh, or ringworm or something to that effect. And then uh, crankbaits. If you're gonna fish on the U.S. side, you know, it's, it's pretty tough to get away from the old jig and minnow is, is a real consistent producer. So that, uh, you know, once you know and understand that, you know, the on Ontario side, you got have to have an Ontario fishing license. You can't, you can't just come, come and go. Um, so there are a few different rules and such that you have to keep track of, but it's really not that big a deal. Uh, I, I prefer the Canadian side because there's a lot less boat traffic and uh, a lot of times the shorelines open up quite a bit faster um, than on the U.S. side. No matter where you're fishing for walleyes right now, jigs are gonna be a big player and that is especially true on the Rainy River. And if you've never river fished before, you'll find that presenting jigs in current is a lot different. So Donnie's gonna break down the three different ways that he likes to fish jigs on the Rainy River. Well, there's a couple different trains of thought. Um, the first being being if there's enough if there's not enough current to pitch. So if I mark a nice pot of fish on side imaging, I'll spot lock up river uh, 30, 40 feet, and and then what I'll do is I'll just pitch out either straight out or a little bit a little bit to the back of the boat, <clears throat> and I basically just hold my rod tip, and the river is sweeping that jig and plastic back around and the river will eventually pull that straight and that paddle tail will start thumping you know and that's if you can just hold your rod without that jig hitting bottom you've probably got the right the right weight of jig on um, if you're constantly in the in the in the bottom of the river then you can lighten up a little bit um, if you're throwing if you're throwing too light and you're marking fish and never getting bit probably want to go a little heavier 
Um, so some bottom contact is all right, but you don't want it just laying on the bottom. Okay, that's pitching. Um, when there's not enough current <clears throat> to pitch, a lot of times we drag. And dragging is, it's essentially just a good pitch behind the boat. I always catch my line like that, let the boat pull it tight, and then give it another sweep. Close my veil and let the boat pull. And I like to drag it at 0.3 to 0.4 and, and really just hold it tight. You can see if, if Nick will zoom in there, the boat is pulling that enough where I know my jig's not laying on the bottom. You can see that the line is snug. The rod has just a little bit of bend to it. That's just about right. Now, if you want to check, you can sling your rod back. And if that slack just lays on the surface, that's perfect. If you sling your line back and it just takes off, it's because your, your bait was way, way high up in the water column. Uh, and then just pull through fish. You know, I'm seeing fish on our side imaging. Um, we're pulling upstream at 0.3 to 0.4. Uh, right now we're using quarters, quarter ounce uh, jigs. So, um, you know, if, you'll know if they if they hit that net jig and plastic going upstream, there'll be no doubt. I do have a lot of customers that are unfamiliar with the technique, and they'll say, you know, well, well, how will I know? You'll know. Like they'll tear the rod out of your hand. It it will be shockingly, shockingly uh, hard bites. I mean, it's it's crazy how how they smash a plastic. Um, and then the last couple of days. I watched a good buddy of mine fish a technique on the river uh, that I've never really seen before. Um, and what he's doing is he's taking his jig and his plastic, you know, paddle tail, and he's chucking it way upstream. And this is counterintuitive to everything that I know about fishing paddle tails. And he just basically pops his rod tip and lets that bait tumble. It's just tumbling down the river. And he pops it, pick up a little slack, and he pops it, and he has been <laughs> taking me to the cleaners with this technique. I'm not real fond of admitting that, but um, it's, uh, it's something I've seen him do year in and year out. And this year I actually got in his boat because I wanted to see it firsthand. And, uh, it produces, so maybe something to think about, you know, when nothing else is working, is don't be afraid to mix it up. I mean, everybody, everybody's got room to learn something new. Now Donnie's gonna break down his entire system for finding walleyes on his electronics and putting jig heads on foreheads. Uh, all right, so we were dragging upstream at point three with quarters, and uh, I marked a good pot of fish off to our right. I stopped the boat, hit spot lock, and I said, hey, switch over to eighths real quick. We're gonna pitch them straight out the side and let the current sweep these baits right past um, the walleyes that I had marked. So I call that jig heads on foreheads. And so we just pitched out here. Our baits are starting to sweep. Well, Charlie, Charlie's still tying in the background. You can see that he's a little slower than I am. So um, my bait is swinging around to the back. And a lot of times when you get hit is right when that current takes the sweep out of your line and that paddle tail starts thumping again so you let it hang if it's just hanging back there a lot of times i'll let it i'll let it hang for just a couple of seconds and that's when they pounce on it it's uh it's an it's a tumbling wounded minnow until it straightens out in that current and all of a sudden that easy snickers is taken off up the river and that's when it's time to grab it so We'll see, this doesn't feel like any giant, but uh, I tell you what, even these cold frozen hands like the way that feels. That's okay. Yeah. Can you that, Donnie? Uh, I think we can probably bolt flip it. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Now finding fish and making sure you're in the area where they live is really important, but if you've ever river fished, you know that sometimes 
It's all about making those tiny little minute presentation changes, like potentially changing the weight of the jig you're using. Uh, sometimes that can make a really big difference. The ticket, Charlie. Yes. So it down, downsizing our jigs there just a little bit has put us in the fish. Guys are frozen up a little bit. Here's a little nicer one. You want net? Yeah. <laughs> Here. <I'll laughs> you can just grab them. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, Daddy. That make a nice salmon. Oh. Charlie, just you just went back to back. I'm on fire, I think. You know that is uh, that is one thing I I try to do uh, every day when I start guiding on the river is. I'll have each customer use a different weight jig. So we've been we've been dragging quarters and pitching quarters, and uh, we had marked this pot of fish, and and the, it seemed like the flow had maybe slowed down a little bit. So I told Charlie, let's throw eights on and and let's pitch to them and see what happens. And I mean, in a matter of five minutes, we've boated six or seven fish. So um, as a guide, having people pitch different weights, a lot of times I can dial in relatively quickly what those fish want and what is actually the proper weighted jig um, for today's application and the conditions can change throughout the day i mean you can have let's say we had rain yesterday you can have more flow you can have less flow um, so that can change day to day or actually hour to hour so um, if if i have one person in the boat that's whaling on them you know, I'll have that person reel in and say, oh, okay, geez, they got an eighth on. Hey, let's everybody else switch to eighths. And, uh, you know, if things slow down, I'll mix it up again. A lot of times I'll throw something different on my rod. And uh, and and if one one weighted jig, you know, if it, whether it's an eighth or a quarter, starts producing, then everyone in the boat can switch over real quick and then everyone's on the fish. Next up, Donnie's gonna talk baits and colors. Um, I don't know if Nick is gonna zoom in here, but here's a couple of my favorites. Uh, you know, if I'm pitching, it's an eighth or a three sixteenths and a paddle tail. Uh, you know, I, I get asked a lot about colors, and what I will say to that is, I've had I've had amazing days with just about every color made. So uh, a lot of times, what I'll do is I'll start myself and each customer with a different color and you can develop a pattern that's working that day relatively quickly um, if you're fishing by yourself that's gonna take a while but uh you know it seems like if, if one person is getting them on purple then everybody will get them on purple or if one person is getting them on on a uh, on a chartreuse orange you know, then everyone will get them on a chartreuse orange. Some days it seems like it doesn't matter. You can throw anything out there. So my advice there it would be to buy a, a good variety of colors so you can be prepared and have what's necessary to get the job done on any given day. Uh, now I will tell you there are some days where it seems like pitching won't get you bit and dragging jigs won't get you bit. And when that happens, I have found or have had days where pulling cranks and behind the boat and this it's not it's not when you think of pulling crankbaits everybody thinks of line counters and and uh, honestly pulling crankbaits on the river is, is pretty simple I just use the same spinning gear that we are uh, pitching jigs with uh, and I'll make sure I have a fluorocarbon leader three four feet long there and literally just huck them three or four boat lengths back. I mean, most of the spots on the river that we're pulling these are less than 12 feet deep. So you, it's not rocket science. You don't have to know precisely where your baits are. Charlie's hooked up. <laughs> Do I gotta get that rod out of your no, way? No, I got a little one. All right. Oh, it's a little, okay. All right. So a lot of days uh, over the years, what I found is if we're really struggling, getting them on jigs and plastics crankbaits is a great second option these are northlands rumble shads uh, i think fives um and i also have these in a variety of colors ready to go so uh don't get stuck into the into the boy boy i've just heard about paddle tails for so long some days they don't go on paddle tails so for whatever reason and it, it seems like on those days we can still get a, a significant amount of fish to go on a crankbait just pulled uh on spinning gear the last couple times that i've been 
up to the Rainy River with Donnie this spring. We've been using a bunch of Northland's new tungsten jig and their MVP jig, and both of them, both of them have been working really good. Um, but that MVP jig in particular is really cool. For me, it's like the perfect paddle tail river fishing swim bait, and that's why it's kind of like a secret weapon up there on the Rainy. Okay, so Northland launched this new MVP jig last fall. Uh, I had a chance to fish it on the river a little bit last fall and I fished it a lot this spring. And there's a couple of things that I think make that MVP ideal for working with plastics. One is the hook gap is enormous. Um, a lot of problems with smaller hook gap is, is a lot of your gap is actually engulfed in the plastic and you can miss hookups uh, because of that. So uh, what Northland did is they increased this hook gap right here, increasing your hooking percentage significantly. The other thing they've done is the point of that hook lines up directly with your tie point. So that enables you to, it transfers your energy. So the, all the energy you're putting into that, to that jig head, is directly in line with the bend of that hook, helping keep those fish pinned up. I've had a ton of success with these last fall uh, when they first came out and so far this spring. I, I think this might be my new favorite river jig. As you'd probably expect, water temperature sometimes can be really important when you're fishing in rivers this time of year. And Donnie's gonna talk a little bit about that topic, sort of break down what he likes to look for when he's up fishing on the Rainy River. So I tend to think, like looking back, Historically for me, uh, some of our best days have been when those water temps hit 39, 40, 41. That's, you know, that's the stuff that every day you kind of hope, like, gosh, I hope we got another degree or two, you know. Uh, this year it's been, it's been really cold. I think we got 36 today um, and, and we're looking at snow now and uh, and some colder days coming, so I don't know that we're gonna gain a whole lot as far as water temperature. Um, so one thing I will say, it, it seems like, it seems like if it stays cold and the water temps stay, you know, 33 to 36 or so, um, a lot of times those bigger walleyes will stage up adjacent, in, in the deeper holes kind of adjacent to where they wanna spawn. Um, and just in a holding pattern, kind of, they, you know, they hang out until the water temperature's right. Um, if, if it's a scenario where we actually are getting some, some thermal activity in the water and we're starting to heat up a little bit, then it seems like we do better up against shore or up a little shallower. So I would say if your water temps are relatively low, I would, I would try to focus on the deeper holes in the river adjacent to where they want to spawn. And if we're getting some, some heat and uh, the temperatures are coming up, say above 38, 38, 39, 40, um, then I would slide up a little shallower. And of course you want to find them on your, on your side imaging or your live imaging, whatever you're using. Uh, but if, boy, if you can find pods of fish up shallow on those warmer water days, boy, that's, that's you're putting the odds in your favor. Well, that's about all we got for you in this video. Special thanks to Donnie O'Bird for sharing a bunch of good information on his home water. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Hopefully you learned something. And if you did, make sure to hit that little red subscribe button down below so we have a lot more awesome content coming in the future. And until then, we'll see you in the next one.